week then? Thanks. Thanks. Uh, my talk is mostly about some methods that you'd use in um, that we've used in planning some NRM projects at the very beginning. So to start with, I'm going to show you a couple of scenarios that um, provide analogies to some of the things I'm going to talk about. The first scenario is this is a really good friend of mine, and um, <laughs> every year she tends to have this great idea that she wants to go out and buy some veggies and plant a vegetable garden. And um, each year she buys the veggies, pops them in the ground, and this tends to be the uh, result three months later. Um, so I'm going to guess that there's actually quite a few people in the room that might be able to relate to this, this scenario. Um, this is usually her way of thinking, is that if you buy some plants and seedlings, somehow you're going to end up with lots of veggies. It's a fairly simplistic uh, level of of planning. Okay, scenario two. This is my other friend, Eve, and she goes and buys similar plants and she pops them in the ground and three months later she ends up with this lovely system like this. So I'm going to guess that maybe there's a few less of you out there that have this kind of scenario at the end and whoever you are, you're probably really good planners. So this is actually her level of planning. Uh, she thinks through the what, when, why, everything you could possibly think of um, to get to her goal, um, which is to get lots of veggies. So um, we're, I'm trying to emulate some of this in some of the ways that we plan for some of the interim projects that we do. Okay, as we all know and from the conference, there's many ways to invest in NRM and to measure the impacts of those investments, but it's definitely a challenge to pick the best method that provides the best value for money, time and information. So um, I'm going to talk to you about some decision-making um, methods that um, we've used and we've got experience with using um, to plan some NRM projects um, at different scales. And this is within uh, Duna and um, the, the scenarios I'm going to talk about, uh, I've got a lot of collaboration with other people um, within Duna across um, branches and that sort of thing. So the methods that I'm going to talk about um, ensure that we have um, a, a realistic plan that can be implemented really easily with all the stakeholders that need to be and that they meet clear objectives. So the, oops, oh dear, what have I done? So the outline of my talk, I'm going to go through three case study projects um, and talk about a, a few methods to identify investment priorities, objectives, <laughs> strategies, monitoring um, indicators within set and quite tight budgets and timeframes. Um, I'm going to talk about conceptual diagrams or conceptual models, value matrices and program logic, and also um, touch on the, uh, our experiences with designing uh, communication products at that early planning stage. So, um, uh, so the first one I'm going to talk to you about is the South East Limestone Coast project, which is ongoing. So the goal of that was to report to the community on the health of the whole limestone coast. So you can see here the limestone coast goes, uh, it's, it's huge, um, it's skinny but very long and there's a lot of potential uh, environmental and socio-economic systems within that um, area that you could potentially focus on to report on the health of the whole thing. So we need to prioritise. So what we did was we used a workshop and we developed some conceptual, a conceptual model within the workshop pro, uh, process. So this top one here, we put on the board a whole lot of um, uh, physical, environmental, socio and economic um, components and then we overlaid um, threats to these which are the little red, all sorts of little red things on there which are threats and um, management impacts. And, um, and the process is a bit of a brainstorm, so it's quite messy and we took things out that were less important and added things in until everybody was pretty happy with it and then we can convert it into a pretty picture like this. So it looks like a bit of a cartoon but it's actually um, behind it sits uh, a lot of um, supported evidence and assumptions that, that can be documented. So a conceptual model like this um, is built by everyone, it, um, it gets buy-in, ownership by everybody, uh, avoids, it usually avoids pet interests um, and I guess a picture like this um, is less easily misinterpreted by a broader audience than say text as well. Uh, it sets a common ground and it justifies components that were chosen. So one of the things in this uh, conceptual model that the, the program team wanted to, to 
get more information on was native vegetation. So there's lots of native vegetation in the, in the region and so we needed to prioritise those. And so for doing that we used a value matrices. So this is a fairly simple thing. This is all done in one, a one-day workshop, by the way. So we use predetermined criteria. And down the side here, you can see we've got resources available for monitoring, uh, extents known, condition data, habitat for threatened species, management actions planned, etc. And then experts nominated a bunch of different vegetation communities. And then we looked at which one um, met the most. Uh, and it happened to be this dryland tea tree. It's just the, uh, the method that I'm trying to talk you through. So um, value matrices like this provide defensible evidence based um, for prioritising assets and they also bring, uh, show some knowledge gaps. So how can we use things like these conceptual models um, to work out, say, what to measure? Well, we looked at um, some of these red arrows here which show uh, the link between um, threats or management things that you can measure and the, and the assets that were chosen. So for example, this motorbike going through the salt marshes here, um, we, we can make predictions about what, he's, what, what the impacts of this are and the tracks on the salt marshes. And there were things like it's going to, possibly going to impact the condition of the salt marsh, the extent and maybe the fragmentation. So these sorts of things then direct you to, or directed us to think about what indicators we would measure in this project. Um, and also we uh, then ensured that, oh, actually I've got, so here you can see uh, resources and the indicators that we chose. So for that particular salt marsh we chose condition, connectivity and remaining extent. Um, so we made sure that they were also, um, uh, there was existing data available and that we had resources to do this. So we didn't end up with a huge range of, uh, uh, a wish list of indicators that you don't necessarily have resources for. So. Um, uh, bah, bah, bah. Next one. So the next project, which is um, still in its early planning phases actually, is um, vegetation condition in the Adelaide Mount Lockerbie Ranges. The project goal is to report on condition on the region-wide condition of native vegetation. So I'm not going to talk to you about any results or anything. It's just um, a case study uh, to show you about program logic, which is this here. So we use program logic to identify information that could contribute to um, out, outcomes and aspirational goals. So, and, and also to, um, so these were data sources here and uh, we looked at how they would contribute to project goals and also to targets within the region and to aspirational goals at the top. So it links these inputs, these are inputs, outputs, short term, medium term, long term and aspirational goals. You possibly can't read that from there, sorry. Um, but we found that a process like this gets everyone on board. It clarifies expectations of what the project could um, achieve and um, yeah, we found it really useful. So this project was about uh, native vegetation and so we did have a one day workshop to look at what uh, prioritising native vegetation and again we used one of these value matrices. So down the side we had a whole bunch of vegetation groups that were proposed and we looked at the values of these, the regions and the monitoring that, happened, that would be in place or could be in place and the potential of the relative investment that was being managed to use as predetermined criteria for selecting some of these. And we did use um, another matrix which was similar to look at the, um, the indicators that we could choose um, from those and on this one it's authentic, it's from the workshop, that's why it's all my own handwriting. So vegetation groups down the side and we looked at veg uh, drivers and pressures and then we looked at expected management outcomes of all of those things and those were the things that led us to think about what indicators we would choose. Um, so yeah, again, that sort of prevents us from developing a huge wish list of indicators that may not be able to be resourced. <coughs> so the final case study was a project we did uh, developing a report card for the Alentjara Willarara region um, based on the impacts of climate change. So again we had a workshop which um, other people have mentioned are really important because they bring together stakeholders and, and all different expertise into the room. So um, the goal was to develop a, a, um, a report card and what we actually did was we, get, we um, got people to draw important valued assets on maps and draw spatial dro lines around them to show the extent of those and then we got them all together, collated them and um, uh, came up with four 
key areas that we prioritised for this particular um, report card. And they were groundwater for communities, uh, rock holes and springs, bush food and medicines, and also landscape habitats. Now they're quite broad, but we didn't. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, yeah. So, um, what was I going to say? So then we predicted how climate change would impact on those systems there, and particularly the changes that we might expect in rainfall and temperature. So how would rainfall and temperature impact on these things? For example, for this one that was uh, groundwater for communities, um, we decided that it was likely to impact on water level, salinity and extraction for communities. So it's just a way of prioritising um, those things. So. Um, we also did up a little, another little conceptual model here which shows uh, the, how climate change can impact on, on particular things. It's really simplistic but it just got everybody on the same page. So this is the picture of now and this is what might happen with um, changes to temperature and rainfall um, just to get uh, everybody thinking on the same, same thing. And this is an excerpt from the actual report card. So here we had a big map of the region um, and we overlaid those key valued assets, I guess, in a spatial context. The wiggly lines represent three different climate zones. And then this here, these arrows show uh, changes in temperature and rainfall, climate change variables um, over the past and, and they're sort of linked to different, component, different spatial areas of the map. So um, this was all designed by everybody in the workshop and uh, got ideas from everybody and it made us all, made us realise, this process made us realise how much information we needed and um, how it could be, sent, how the information could be synthesised into a digestible, good, effective report card such as that. So um, just into summary, I guess the conceptual models that I talked about, they're a great holistic communication tool. Um, they're built by everybody to consolidate ideas and understanding. They can depict the most important components of a system and how they interact and they can help prioritise um, assets and management impacts as well. Value matrices, I showed you a few of those and they provide evidence-based qualitative justification for prioritising assets. And bear in mind that these things, you know, we could do these in a day and they're very early planning methods as well. Um, they can avoid biased decisions uh, and also to ensure that activities and priorities that we chose were, were within budget time frame and capacity because you can make those things some of your predetermined criteria. And program logic, um, that shows specific pathways of how inputs contribute to outcomes, plans and broader long term goals as well and it tends to keep project and stakeholders focused. So um, just to finalised, the methods that we used in these projects worked pretty well in workshop scenarios and they forced us all to have really clear objectives and what we were doing. And I guess it allows um, people who are writing grant strategi st uh, strategies and policies and also people who are doing on-ground work to see how their work fits in to an overall project or a plan when you, when you have things um, set out like this. So I guess if their activities are not related directly to some of the priorities that you've chosen, um, then their resources might be wasted or um, the, the overall project goals might not be met. So yeah, I guess the, some of the methods I've highlighted have um, helped us keep on track to try and make sure we meet our project goals like Eve's garden. Like that one, not like that one. Thank you, Unfortunately, we're out of time.